So back in December, I started getting a little bit of indigestion. No big deal at all. I've had indigestion before. Take some Tums, you'll be fine. When I went into the doctor, he said, look, your, your blood works healthy, you look healthy, you've lost a little bit of weight, but that's just because you're not able to eat as much. I'll, I'll send you to the GI doc, but I really think you're fine. When they scoped me um, was two weeks ago, and that's when they saw something very concerning. Uh, cut to four days later, um, and uh, the diagnosis was uh, stage four stomach cancer. God, you are king everlasting. You ordained this universe. And through your breath, you spoke it into existence, the word eternal. And you purpose for it to be as beautiful and as wonderful as it is. And as much as you set galaxies into motion, you place stars in the sky that will burn for millions of years. You placed planets and solar systems in the universe that we could never begin to fathom, millions of light years apart from one another. God, as powerful as you've made the cosmos, you put your image on us. And as much as we can spend our lives chasing the perfect sunset or spending time behind the most beautiful waterfall, Lord, you look to us and you say, we are your prized creation. God, thank you so much for loving us so deeply. Though we are so frail, though we are so broken, though we rebel against you, you love us beyond anything else. God, you are amazing. Yeah, it was a bit of a shock. Um, just a few weeks ago, found out, uh, and we went from, you know, all our plans, doing all the things that we were going to do, all of a sudden, yeah. everything came to a crashing halt. I'll bet. Um, so, didn't feel any symptoms at the time, except for a little bit of indigestion and some weight loss. Uh, so, to get the news, stage four stomach cancer um, was, was a huge shock. Uh, it's been getting a, a bit worse. Um, uh, now I can feel the pain pretty consistently. Yes. Uh, in my stomach, uh, it's keeping me from sleeping. Uh, my thoughts are probably doing the same thing too. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, learning to trust God and walk in faith in this time and uh, absolute privilege to grow closer to the Lord, um, to be brought on my knees uh, much more frequently, um, yeah. to, to recognize the dependence that we have upon Him. Yeah. And yeah. It's a blessing in a way. I will be starting chemo in a few hours, gonna get a port placement. Um, was praying that it wouldn't have to come to this. Um, was praying that the Lord would do something miraculous before this. Uh, he still could, there's still some hours left, but um, as it is, I'm staring chemo in the face. Not something I'm looking forward to. Uh, I've heard a lot of um, horror stories. Uh, never thought that this would be me. <laughs> and I have to say, the side effects were so minimal this time that I wondered whether the chemo actually did anything. And so thank you so much for praying. Um, I think that made a tremendous difference. I still have hair too. Um, in fact, my mom told me to get it cut. Uh, she said it's getting long enough that I should cut it. And I said, I'm pretty sure I, I'll, I may be getting a free haircut. Uh, she said, uh, no, if it falls out, it'll fall out in clumps and it'll look horrible. So cut it down for her. So I might just go ahead and get a haircut before you see me next time. Why am I talking so much about my hair? Um, because I didn't script any of this. I never do. So tell us about that journey from Allah to Jesus. Well, you're absolutely right. I was raised in a family that loved Islam, and I was taught to love Islam. I was taught to love Allah. Uh, but concomitant with that was a belief that Islam was a religion of peace. And so when I saw things happening in the news overseas as a child, I thought that's not my religion. Uh, it didn't really strike home until 9-11. Uh, when you had to deal with it. And I realized, well, these people really did claim to be Muslim. Uh, so that was such a stark contrast to the Islam that I knew. Uh, at the same time, I had just started university, and so I was meeting new people. 
uh, I had been used to challenging Christians in their faith. I had realized that most Christians simply were unable to defend the basic tenets of their faith. Why do they think Jesus is God? Why do they rely on the Bible? What is the Trinity and why believe in it? When I asked Christians about these things, they never could respond. But now when I got to the university, I was meeting people who had begun to think about these things. And so I have made a friend who specifically had accepted Christianity a few years prior. And as I'm putting my stuff away, he pulls out a Bible and starts reading. I'm thinking, no way, this guy's a Christian. This will be fun. <laughs> and so <laughs> I looked at him and I said, David, you realize that book you're reading is not trustworthy. And he closes the Bible and says, go on. <laughs> so you guys are aware. I missed it. I was in the moment. I was just going to take him down. It's like, David, think about it. Didn't Jesus speak Aramaic? But the earliest New Testament was written in Greek. And so by the time you actually have a recording of what Jesus said, it's already gone through a translation. But the Bible that lasted the longest period of time in church history was the Latin Bible. And so it goes through another translation. And then from Latin, it went to German before it came to English. So you had another translation of a translation. So you've got a translation of a translation of a translation of a translation is what you're reading. How do I know that I'm actually reading Jesus' words when it's been translated so many times? Here was a guy who also cared about his faith. He cared about his God. And so I would ask him questions. I saw him reading his Bible one day and I said, how do you know you can even trust the Bible? And so we started having arguments about biblical reliability. That went to questions about the Trinity. It went to questions about Jesus' deity. Um, and, and the thing that mattered to me was that he would keep coming back. He would keep engaging me. He believed and his zeal was something I resonated with. Now, I had used that challenge on Christians before, but what I didn't know about David is that he had been raised an atheist. Five years prior, he had seen his friend Randy reading a Bible, and he had challenged Randy. He said, Randy, do you know why you're reading a Bible? Because you were born in America. Had you been born in India, you'd be reading the Vedas. Had you been born in uh, Arabia, you'd be reading a Quran. Had you been born somewhere else, you'd be reading something else because people like you just believe what you're taught to believe. A bit condescending. The irony is David was just saying that because he was raised atheist, but whatever, it's fine. Randy systematically dismantles David's arguments. He starts explaining to him why the scriptures are reliable, why he trusts in the gospel, starts giving him evidence for his faith. Over the course of the year, David slowly begins to realize that the Christian message is true. And then he spends the next four years doing nothing but studying how to defend the gospel. And then I walked into the room. <laughs> and in fact, David had been praying all that morning. He had been saying, God, there's a Muslim on the team. If you want me to share the gospel with him, just open the door. And I just walked right through the door. I was like, hey, I'm here. <laughs> and so David says, Nabil, Earlier today, I heard you speaking on the phone with your mom. Were you speaking in English? I said, no. And he said, but then I asked you what you talked about with your mom, and you told me in English. Was that a bad translation? No. He said, Nabil, you're multilingual. You can take what you hear in one language and accurately translate that message into another language. And so were the disciples. Whatever language Jesus was speaking, yes, he spoke Aramaic, but he could have been speaking Greek. Whatever language he was speaking, the disciples heard it, wrote it down in Greek. And we have in our possession today over 5,000 manuscripts of the New Testament in the original Greek. Nabil, we know with certainty what Jesus said. So this is the biggest hang up for Muslims. Um, it's, did Jesus claim to be God or not? Yeah. Um, and Muslims believe Jesus is a prophet, uh, but they don't believe he's God. And in fact, the Quran shows Jesus talking to Allah, denying that he ever claimed to be God. And so if you can show a Muslim that Jesus claimed to be God, that will change their perspective of everything. And that was the, the major battle for me. Um, but when I saw that not just Paul says Jesus is God, you know, in, in, in uh, Romans 10, 9, for example, not just Peter saying it in 2 Peter 1, 1, but Jesus claims to be God in John's gospel and not just John, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke. When you start seeing it in the pages of scripture, that changed everything. The scan came back and the impression was that what has happened has been remarkable. 
the primary mass of the tumor, what was in my stomach, is now gone. Um, so that's a matter of huge rejoicing. Everything that was present has either shrunk or disappeared. Um, so that was really good news. At least right away, it felt like really good news, but then I get discouraged pretty quickly. My stomach has been hurting more uh, over the past week than it had before. I'm beginning to think, man, Lord, if you've been willing to heal to a significant degree, which this has been, then why, why haven't you just touched me and healed all the way? Uh, I get stories from people all the time of complete and total healing. And so for the rest of the night, I just challenge him argument after argument. I'm like, what, what do you mean Jesus died for the sins of mankind? How does one man's death pay for everybody's sins? What do you mean that God is a trinity? How can three be one? What do you mean? And I would just challenge him on all these basic principles of Christianity. And for the first time, someone had thought about it and was actually giving me responses that began to make sense. Although I wasn't done challenging. It's not like I just believed him the moment he gave me a response. So I challenged, we pushed and pulled. He started pu pushing on Islam a bit and I started pushing back. And so we're going back and forth. By the end of the weekend, we're nowhere near done with arguing. So we decide to go back to our university and sign up for courses so that we can sit in the back of the lecture hall and argue with one another. And in the middle of that, we end up doing projects together. We end up doing homework together. He starts coming to my house and my mom makes him biryani and korma and roti and makhni. And then I go to his house and his dad gives me beef jerky. I was like, okay, that's fine, whatever, we're cool. And so in the course of all this, going to each other's house, living life together, we actually became best friends. I realized that David was my best friend. David and I started investigating how to prove whether Islam or Christianity was true, and we turned to the Muslim faith. I started reading the early stories of Muhammad's life for myself, mm. instead of just receiving the stories, reading from you know, beginning to the end. Doing your own investigation. And that's yeah. when I came across yeah. all these stories that no one had shared with me before. Things that made me think, why am I following this man? Wow. Uh, everything that I had heard up until then had been very positive, but now I'm hearing stories about you know, him being uh, bewitched, him uh, beheading hundreds of people on the same day, uh, him doing, you know, treating women in certain ways, nothing that I'd ever heard before. And naturally I kind of said, no, that can't be true, that can't be true. Uh, but what I later realized was this is coming from the same sources that all the positive stuff that I had learned came from. I have to take it or leave it. I can't selectively cherry pick my profit. And when I came to that realization, it was, it was a real earthquake for me. I'm still trusting in the Lord. Uh, I believe that God is a healer. Um, I take his word seriously uh, in Matthew 8, 17, that he took our infirmities and bore our diseases. I take his word seriously at Mark 11, 24, when he says that whatever we pray for, if we believe that we have received it, it will be given to us. Jesus says, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. So you're asking for something in prayer. You're in the middle of requesting it. And then you're supposed to, according to Jesus, believe that you've already received it. That's presumptuous. That is presuming quite a bit um, that you will receive healing. That's what I'm asking for. I'm saying, God, heal me. And Jesus is telling me, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Wow. Um, am I saying this is a formula? Am I saying that Jesus uh, has to heal you because you believe that you've received healing. That's not what I'm saying. All I'm pointing out is Jesus tells us to be presumptuous in our faith, to actually believe that we've received what we're praying for in the midst of praying for it. I, I believe that the Lord is healing me. I believe that there's a tremendous work being done, but there's also a great deal of suffering that is still happening. I'm still waking up at night um, by stabs of pain in my stomach. Um, I'm having difficulty swallowing. Um, but of course, the worst part of this time right now is the mental anguish of what if I don't survive? Um, what happens to my family? What happens to my daughter? And so I said, okay, the New Testament's reliable, but does that mean Christianity is true. No, it doesn't. How do I know whether Christianity is actually true or not? And so for the next few years, we embarked on an investigation into the evidence of Christianity versus the evidence of Islam. I was trying to convert him to Islam. He's trying to convert me to Christianity. Um, and we would just share the arguments. Now you might be saying, what, what, what do you mean evidence for a faith? Don't you just pick a faith based on what appeals to you? And I would say, no, there's so many different faiths out there. You've got Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, 
You, you've, you've got, of course, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, the big three monotheistic faiths, all these different faiths. Different faiths appeal to different people. Usually, the faith you were raised in appeals to you more than every other faith does. But that doesn't make the faith true. What makes a faith true and what makes it false? Interestingly, the Christian message stands or falls on the resurrection of Jesus. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ is not risen, our faith is in vain, and we're of all people most to be pitied. I'm not sure if you've heard the gospel before, but here's what it is in a nutshell. God himself, after having created us, knew that we would rebel against him, and indeed, we all rebel against him. And the penalty for separating ourselves from God like that is death. You might say, why would God kill you for sin? That doesn't, that's, that's a bit extreme. No, God doesn't kill you for sin. When you sin, you remove yourself from the source of life. When you rebel against God, you're looking at the source of life and saying, I'm walking away from you. And so you incur death for yourself. God enters into this world, dies on our behalf so that we don't have to die and be separated from him. And then he rises from the dead to prove that death has been defeated and to show us what will happen to us. We will rise from the dead one day and be with him. That's the gospel message. I saw Jesus in a dream recently and he sat down and he had a conversation with me. Now, unfortunately, I don't remember what we talked about, um, but one thing that I do remember, uh, I remember him saying the word baby followed by the words sponge bath. Now, Aya loves baths and she loves sponges. She loves playing with things that, you know, the water squeezes out and she likes looking at the drops and imitating the sound that the drops make. But when I was giving her this, this sponge bath, as soon as she saw the sponge, she just started crying almost hysterically and asking me and my wife to pull her out of the of the tub. She was saying, mama, mama, baba, baba. And she was just asking us to pick her up because she was terrified of the sponge. Um, now you have to understand, I'd been looking all forward all day to giving her the sponge bath and I'd been praying about it. Um, and this was not what I was expecting at all. But she was just absolutely terrified. I began to think if this wasn't an image that God was showing me um, of what's going on in my life where God is my father and he has been cleansing me and he has been, or at least he wants to cleanse me through this, through this cancer, this illness. Now I'm not saying it was God's will for me to have this cancer or illness, but I am saying that if you have an illness, you can glorify God through it. You can be cleansed through it. You can learn from it and you can become a better person by it and give God the glory through it. This past week I've resolved then not to be a slave to fear, not to pray so fervently for healing out of fear. Now that doesn't mean I can't pray for healing, I should, um, but I shouldn't be afraid, I shouldn't be motivated by fear. And I think I was letting that happen to me. Um, this disease is in my father's hands. Uh, honestly, come what may, God is in control. I love my father and I trust him. Um, and he's holding this sponge, and if I'm sitting there crying my head off, asking to be rescued such that he can't do the work he wants to do, I'm not glorifying him, I'm not honoring him. Does the evidence show that he died on the cross, and does the evidence show he rose from the dead? Interestingly, Islam denies all three of these points. Chapter 4, verse 157 of the Quran says he, does not die, he did not die on the cross. Chapter 5, verse 72 of the Quran says he was not God. He didn't claim to be God. So when you establish the case for one, you're actually bringing down the case for the other. This is why when people say all religions teach the same thing, I'm like, that's an absurd statement. These are diametrically opposed. Let me put it to you once again in another way. In Christianity, you have to believe Jesus is God to go to heaven. In Islam, if you believe Jesus is God, you're going to hell. Simple as that. They can't be more diametrically opposed. But when I studied the evidence, when I studied the history, and I'm talking about through a historical lens, not reading the Bible and saying, well, the Bible says it, therefore it's true. Not at all, I didn't trust the Bible. I'm reading the Bible the way a historian reads ancient texts, and I came to the conclusion 
Jesus did die on the cross, and he did, the best explanation by far of what happened to him is that he rose from the dead. The radiation treatment got worse uh, and worse uh, as far as side effects were concerned, um, to the point where um, it was really, really difficult to eat much of anything. Um, uh, the past few days I've been waking up in the morning um, with uh, some pretty bad nausea, some vomiting. Um, I really uh, feel for you expectant mothers now <laughs> to wake up with um, morning sickness. Um, I wake up with that pretty much every morning now. Oh my goodness! Yeah, it's a video! Say hi! Can you say hello everyone? Can you say hi? <laughs> hey everyone, uh, I had promised to show you my daughter Aya um, in a video and this is her. Um, I think she is the most perfect child in the universe. Yes. Can you say yes? <laughs> uh, um, so today is my birthday. I'm officially 34 years old. Um, and um, Michelle put a brand new shirt on Aya. She looks like sunshine, uh, which is making me really happy. You have people like Marcus Borg, Bart Ehrman, who's himself agnostic, saying things like this, that Jesus died by crucifixion is as sure as any historical fact can be. If there's anything we can know about the historical Jesus life, it's that he died by crucifixion. So the scholars across the board are saying fact number one, Jesus died by crucifixion. Fact number two that Gary Habermas points out is that the disciples of Jesus truly believed he had risen from the dead. This was a decision that would cost me everything. Uh, my entire family, all my friends, the future that I had planned out, um, it would change and cost literally everything. When I started investigating the evidence, instead of just listening to stories, I said, what does history say? And I went to the earliest books written about Muhammad's life. And when you read those books, you find horrific things that you've never been told before. The stuff that ISIS knows. The stuff that Al-Qaeda knows, the Taliban, they know this stuff. We weren't taught this in the West. And I'm studying the evidence and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, is this my prophet? And so all of a sudden I had to deal with the cognitive dissonance of what is all this? And the evidence, the argumentation that I thought existed for Islam all crumbled at the, at the moment of investigation. And the more I studied the case for Christianity, the more and more solid it became. And so now I'm dealing with a real dilemma, instead of just arguing with my friend, now it's about my soul, now it's about my life and about the world. And so I ask God, God, can you show me what's true? I've done as much as my mind can do. I need you to show me what's true. And so I prayed and I said, God, can you show me a vision or a dream? That's how our family always prayed for guidance from God. And through a series of visions and dreams, he pointed out to me that Christianity was true. Um, but that even wasn't enough either. Um, then, I, then I asked God for a little bit more, um, and he led me to the pages of the Bible. Martha says, even now, despite all the odds, despite the fact that my brother is dead, I know who you are. And so, even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, so Martha gets this, well, what's he talking about? Is he saying now or is he talking about the resurrection? She, so she's testing the waters here a bit. And she says, Martha, and she says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So she's asking Jesus, what kind of he will rise again? And Jesus said to her, we're now in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Amen. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? What's my point? Never give up hope. Never give up hope. No matter what the doctor has said, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you will always have hope till your last breath. And that's where I am. Yeah, first line treatment failed. Yeah, I was kind of shaken. Yes, last week was rough, but I know this God. 
Do you believe this? Because death will come. Um, it might come at the ripe old age of 82, 83. Uh, scripture tells us the years of our life are 70 or by reason of strength 80. That's Psalm 90 verse 10. So you might make it to 70, you might make it to 80, and that would be fantastic. Uh, you might be like me and get, being given a diagnosis wherein you're given nine months to live. I know initially I'd said a year and a half to two years, but that was assuming stage three. Stage four is nine months. Um, but it might be that you get in a car accident tomorrow and you have nine seconds to live before it's the end. Um, there's no telling how long it's going to be before we die, and we all will die. But what Jesus is telling us is though we die, we may live. I need time to mourn. Because for a Muslim to give up their Islamic life is to give up everything. My mom had built her whole reputation, her whole life's value was in serving the mosque and in preaching Islam. She's the daughter and granddaughter of missionaries. And in an honor and shame culture, for your son to become a Christian, your only son to become a Christian is worse than if, if he had died. And I put the Bible and the Quran in front of me. And I said, God, I need your comfort. And so I opened the Quran and I started looking for verses of comfort. And for the first time, I realized that there is not a single verse in the Quran designed to comfort a hurting man. Now there's verses that say, if you repent, God will forgive you and stuff like that. But nothing that says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. <laughs> nothing that reaches the heart. And so I put the Quran away. I said, this book doesn't apply to my life. And I opened up the Bible and I said, I don't know where to turn. Uh, I know Christians read the New Testament, so I'll go to Matthew chapter 1. Saw it was a bunch of genealogies, so I skipped it. I was a Muslim. I had an excuse. Skipped it. Didn't take me long to get to Matthew chapter 5, and this is what it says. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And I thought, this is exactly what I just prayed. God put this verse in here for me. I mean, you guys can read it if you want, but it's my verse. <laughs> And I was like, this is amazing. And as I read it, it was like it was electric and it jumped off the page and kick-started my heart. And I was like, who is this God? And I read the next verse. It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And I'm thinking, I hunger and thirst for righteousness. I'm not righteous. Every time I try to be righteous, I fall, I sin. But you're telling me just that I hunger and thirst for righteousness means I'm blessed? What kind of God is this? And they start reading through the scripture, not trying to tear it down as I always had, but actually to receive what it had to say, I encountered an unconditionally loving father. And I thought, this is amazing. And I didn't want to miss a thing, so I was reading every single footnote. And I would ask God a question. I'd be like, God, how do I know you're even hearing me right now? And I'd read the footnote. If you want to know God can hear you, go to 1 John 3. Thanks. Boom. First John 3. And I start reading and I'm going back and forth every single footnote. It takes me a while to get from Matthew 5 to Matthew 10. But when I finally get to Matthew 10, this is what I find. He who proclaims me before the people of this world, I will proclaim before my Father in heaven. And he who denies me before the people of this world, I will deny before my Father in heaven. You see, I had all the evidence. The evidence was solid. I had the spiritual guidance, dreams and visions. I had the emotional guidance but I had not proclaimed because I knew it would cost me my family. But as if God knew what I was thinking, the next verses say this, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The, the new oncologist that I met today said, Nabil, I just want to be very frank with you. This is not a curable form of cancer. The best we can hope to do is to stave off uh, the inevitable by trying to control it for a while. Um, and, and he said that to me, uh, a rude reminder of something that I already know, which is that I do need a miracle if I'm actually gonna survive. More of the hair is missing. Uh, it is now at a point where it's scaring children. And so um, I wanted to kind of um, uh, let Aya get used to the hair falling out before going bald, but I think, I think we've gotten to that point. So I'm gonna go ahead and shave it uh, soon, so probably before the next 
video. And so like Peter, I'm stuck saying, we've seen you, God. I've seen you. I know that you are the truth. And, and in the face of this diagnosis, where else can I turn? You are the truth. You are God. You're the one who gave me life. You're the one who can bring me out of this. With one touch, God, with one touch, you can heal me. Where else can I turn? And I was thinking, okay, God, I get it. If I really love my parents, I will proclaim you to them because you are the truth. But it's not just my parents, it's my entire life, the whole Islamic community, all my friends, everything that I've planned, it's all going to go. You know what the next verses say? He who loses his life for my sake will find it. Matthew 10, crazy convicting. So I bowed my knee and I prayed. Well, no one had told me about a sinner's prayer. I've been with David for four years. No one told me about a sinner's prayer. Uh, but I prayed. I gave my life to Christ in that moment. And um, even though I assented in that moment to the gospel, I think I actually understood it a few days later when I had seen my father cry for the first time in my life. When he found out what had happened, he said these words to me, Nabil, today I feel as if my backbone has been ripped out from inside me. You have to understand, my dad is like this pillar of strength in my mind. He's the warrior. He goes out and fights for the country. I'm the guy who made him cry. And my mom, if you had met her up until that moment, she had always been full of life, gregarious, hospitable, welcoming people in, feeding them. There was always a light shining in her eyes. And in that moment, it was as if I reached into her soul and turned that light off. And she has never been the same. And when they left, I just crumbled to the ground and I just started crying. And I'm saying to God, why didn't you kill me? And I don't know where your theology stands. I'm just here to testify to what happened in my life. As I'm saying, why didn't you kill me? Why didn't you kill me? I heard these words because this is not about you. And it was like I was rooted to the ground. I could not move for 10 minutes. I was stuck in place. And when I finally did get up and I walked away, it was as if the person who had been there crying was somebody else. And it was as if all the issues I had were somebody else's issues. And I walked outside and I looked at the world and it all looked so different. And I looked at a person crossing the street. It's a fairly mundane thing, someone crossing the street. But for the first time, it hit me that that's not just someone. That person is worth so much, God died for them. Now you have to understand, in the Muslim perspective, God doesn't come into this world. This world's too filthy. God doesn't die for anyone. Why would God do that? They're his servants. He's God. He's created the universe. He's majestic. Why would he do any? He would never do any of that. And the answer is he would because he loves them that much. They're worth that much to him. And the creator of the universe, the one who's worshiped by angels for all eternity, if you just saw one of those angels, you'd be tempted to worship it. That's how magnificent they are. They're all worshiping him. And he comes into this world for us to die for us. There's just something going on um, with my stomach. I'm not entirely sure what. Uh, ever since I started the immunotherapy, there's been significant stomach pain. Um, and so such that whenever I try to eat anything, even drink water, uh, I have to lie down um, because it just hurts. Uh, it hurts quite a bit. I'm just thinking, I really want a vacation from this. Can I just have a day of not feeling pain? Day of being able to eat whatever I wanted and being able to just lift my daughter and throw her in the air without feeling weak. And so that had been a thought that had come across my mind and I wonder if God gave me that day this past Friday and I didn't even really realize it till it was over. Uh, but I got a day of reprieve, and so I thank God for that. If you have cancer, there is no vacation from it. You don't get a day off. Um, every single day is 
praying and, and asking the Lord to move and trying to make it through and thinking about what you're eating and thinking about resting enough every single day. There's no vacation. I know that one day I'll be with you in glory and every tear will be dried. Just like Revelation 21 tells us, you will dry every tear from our eyes. But for now, Lord, give me the strength and the grace to make it through the day, to worship you and love you in spite of the pain. I saw a quotation from Mother Teresa today. Uh, I don't know the full context of the quotation, but it said something to the sort of, when we endure suffering for the sake of Christ, we come close enough that he can kiss us. Don't know exactly what that means, but I like it um, and I'm gonna take it. I had a dream a few months ago that Jesus gave me a big bear hug uh, and I can just imagine receiving a kiss from the Lord. John's gospel indicates that Jesus was flogged extra, more than the average person. Cicero tells us that people's intestines used to fall out of their body during the flogging process. The whip would break their abdominal walls open and their intestines would fall out. Veins and arteries were laid bare. People's skin was hanging from their body in ribbons. People died during the flogging process. Why did our God choose this? They crucified you right here, through your radius and your ulna, this interosseous space. There's something that runs there. It's called the median nerve. Have you ever tapped your funny bone? Imagine driving a nail through it. They did that on both sides and a seven inch nail through the feet. Why do they give you the nail through the feet? So that you could breathe. Because if you just hang there, you're not gonna be able to breathe out. You need to But every time you're doing that, you're scraping a skinless back against splintered wood. Every single breath Jesus took on the cross was excruciating. And in fact, that's where the word excruciating comes from. Excruz, from the cross. They had to invent a word to describe how painful this was. Now, let's bring all this together. God, the Trinity, eternity past, lived in a community of love. He creates man. Man becomes hateful, angry, sinful, rebellious. God then goes into this world to rescue man, to take man's sin upon himself. In order to take the sin of man, he became a man. The wages of sin was death. We saw that in the, in the Garden of Eden. When man rebels against God, that leads to death. So death has to be paid for. God wants to save mankind, so he has to pay the penalty for men. That is death. But he doesn't just choose any death, which he could have. He chose death on the cross. Why? And the answer is because if you have ever thought, why me, God? Why am I the one to suffer all this physical pain? What did I do to deserve this? You can take a look at Jesus and Jesus says to you, I understand. I know this world is broken, my child, but I love you and I am here with you. God did that? He loves us that much? It's incomprehensible, but we know it's true. We know it's true. The resurrection happened. Jesus claimed to be God, then he died on the cross and he proved it by rising from the dead. God died on the cross. That God who made the universe suffered that death because he loves us that much. That is the Christian message. That is worth believing. Now, if you ask me, Nabil, you had a perfect life. You had a family that loves you. You, had, you, had, you were becoming a doctor. You had, you had a good place in society. Everything was great for you. Was it worth it? Absolutely it was worth it. I would do it a hundred times over again. Today, my, my mom and dad didn't come to my wedding. Every single time I see a video of a son dancing with his mother at his wedding, I have to think that it was worth it. Every time I see parents lovingly hug their children and say, we're proud of you, I have to think it was worth it. Because it was worth it. 
And if I have to die the same kind of death that Christ died in order to proclaim this message of hope to other people who are here, that would be the greatest honor I could ever have. I got a stent placed last week because uh, I hadn't been able to eat for a few weeks. And the doctor thought maybe if we put a stent in, if we go in with a scope and we see that there's some kind of blockage in your stomach, some, something occluding the food, um, then, then perhaps putting the stent in will start helping you eat again. Uh, the stent was dislodged uh, and it left um, my stomach uh, and came all the way up into my, into my esophagus. Um, and so if you can imagine a 14 centimeter mesh tube, I guess that's about that long, um, stuck in your throat, um, that's what was going on. And so um, I was just vomiting um, blood uh, as we were um, trying to make our way to the ER. And then while I was in the ER, I was in excruciating pain. I've never felt or imagined pain like this before. Um, it, was just, it was internal, as if something inside me was trying to explode out. And um, they put me on some pain meds. And I'm not going to share the whole course of the hospitalization with you, but uh, lots of things went wrong in terms of bureaucratic red tape and, and procedures and such. Um, and that's why it took, even though I had this tube in my throat, from Friday morning until Sunday afternoon for them to take it out. So it was 60 hours that this mesh tube was, and it was expanding inside my esophagus. And so the tube, when it goes, it tries to expand. Um, and uh, during that time, I was feeling such tremendous pain that I almost went to this new uh, phase of being basically where I'm not feeling the pain. I'm watching myself feel the pain. Um, and so people would be asking me questions and um, you know, there'd be a whole bunch of things going on around me. None of that would be processing in my head and even the pain itself would not be processing in my head. I'd be almost as if I was watching myself saying, that person looks like they're in tremendous pain. It's like, wait a minute, that's me. <laughs> that's, that's me going through that pain. As I was going through the worst of the pain, um, the absolute worst, I felt like I heard voices of reassurance. I, I don't know if um, I don't know if it was just my head as I was going through tremendous pain, or if the Lord was speaking to me, um, or if angels were whispering assurances. But I just felt a presence that, even though it wasn't physically there, I just knew there was a presence there. Um, and then sometimes, uh, like I had some friends come to pray for me. And, um, as they were praying for me, I, I was thinking, did they lay their hands on my head? Did they lay their hands on my stomach? And I would look to see what they were doing and they'd be standing next to me and they weren't laying hands, but I could feel hands on my head or on my stomach. Uh, and I was just thinking, are these, is, is the Lord sending me angels? Um, and so um, I really think, well, I no, I know now. I know for certain, based on this past week's experiences, uh, that when you're going through the absolute worst of it, uh, God will be there. God will be there, and He will send His comfort, uh, be it through ministering angels or through His own voice. I'm still not sure which. Um, he was there for me, and I don't think I'm anyone special, so I think He'd be there for you if you're going through something like that as well. Um, without a doubt, the, the worst pain I've ever felt in my life, and God was there. Well, I've been in the hospital 30 days now, something like that, where when I arrived, my stomach was bleeding out, basically exsanguinating. It wouldn't stop bleeding through the tumors. So we really had no choice but to take out my stomach or just face a bunch of blood loss, which would ultimately lead to death. So they took out my stomach. We've been trying to recuperate since then. As you can tell, I've been very short of breath. Okay, the scripture that I gave to you 
is from 2 Timothy chapter four. This is the last chapter that Paul penned before his execution. Are you with me? He is staring death in the face and he's thinking, what is the legacy I'm leaving behind? And he looks to his student, he looks to his disciple, Timothy, and he charges him. Now this is the culmination of a life lived for God. And he says to Timothy, I charge you with this because you are gonna carry this fight after me. He says, I charge you in the presence of God, of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So the doctors are really worried about my liver. They've already taken out my stomach, that part went well. They found some tumors in my liver, but they don't think that's the cause of the issue. I'm not entirely sure what is. So here we are. Please pray for me. That God would heal my liver. Indeed, that God would heal my whole body. And restore me to life once again. That I can see my home. See my wife, see my daughter. As you can tell, I'm not in the hospital. I was released today, exactly five weeks of hospitalization. Two separate doctors sit down and explain to me that Nabil, if these numbers get worse, you may enter into liver failure and there's nothing we can do for you at that point. Um, that will be the end. He said you will die. He just said you will die um, if, if we don't fix your liver. I'm looking out and I'm praying with all my heart that one day I will see my daughter in one of these seats. But I charge you, I charge you as if you were my son or my daughter. Do not live this life thinking that you are just a person. You are an adopted heir, a son of God, a daughter of God, a prince or a princess sent to combat for the kingdom in this world of darkness. And you can bring life with the words that you speak. You can bring life as you reach out to the people in your workplace. Courage and conviction, what a powerful theme. Yeah, if we were gonna die and go to the grave and that would be it, what point is there to have courage and conviction? No, you can go into enemy fire. You can go into lands riddled with Ebola. You can go into sex trafficking trains and not worry if they will kill you because you have eternal life. He has already overcome the world, take heart. And here's the thing, here's the thing, here's where it gets magical. My doctor said to me that I have a 4% chance of surviving five years. And I said to him, you don't know our God. God is able to do immeasurably more than you ask or imagine. And you look at yourself and you think, what can God do with me? Let me tell you, he took the cross, which is the worst thing that has ever happened in human history. Think about it, the death of God at the hands of those whom he created, the people he loved, hating him so much that they flay him and kill him. He took the worst thing that ever happened in human history and he turned it into the best thing that ever happened in human history, our salvation for all eternity. The doctors have pretty much given up on treating me. Um, they think my body is in its final stages of life. The doctors have decided no more calories for me for a few days. And if that means bad things happen, then bad things happen. So it's looking pretty grim. 
I could really use your prayers. Something that I'm kind of wrestling with through all this. It's where does my faith need to be versus I as a believer and a real person. Where can I actually find my faith? Um, in other words, do I need to perform? Do I need to say, I'm going to have this level of faith right now? And honestly, I don't think so. I think God understands where I am right now. And he comes alongside us in that. And he loves us and he gives us the strength for today. Lord, we know you are able. Please heal. Please come through. But if it shouldn't be your will, your sovereign will at the end of the day, then I trust you. And I love you anyway. We praise you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I think it's very important that we discuss matters of truth. But at the end of the day, that is supposed to be undergirded by love and by peace. When we talk to people about our beliefs, we should do it through a lens of love. And the whole point should be to bring people together um, to bring people together to the truth and not to hurt one another, but to help one another. And I've noticed at times that people will take the information that I share and use it to undercut one another. Uh, that has not been my intent. My whole point in, in teaching is for love to reign. And so... As you consider my ministry, I hope it leaves uh, a legacy of, of love, of peace, of truth, um, of caring for one another. That's my hope and my, my purpose behind this. And so if at any point I've said anything that seems to contravene that, I do apologize. And I hope that that's not the legacy that I leave behind. Um, so please also pray for my family. Uh, they have been taking such great care of me over the past few weeks, especially my father, but also my mother and my sister and my wife. Um, I do hope that there'll be people, uh, who will pray for them should the worst happen to me. So please do consider them going forward in your prayers on a daily basis. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Um, you know, our God is a God of love. And that should be what keeps us driven. That should be foremost in our mind. Um, so whether you're talking to a Hindu, a Jew, a Muslim, a Christian, whoever you're talking to, uh, may it be out of love. Thanks very much, everyone. I'll talk to you again soon, I'm sure. Bye-bye. Abba, our Father, we thank you and we praise you 
for the life of Nabil Qureshi. How this man, at age 34, has accomplished more than 10 men that have a 90-year life. Lord, how he has preached all over the world, passionately, fearlessly, in the midst of constant threat and constant attack. You have filled him to overflowing with the power of the Holy Spirit. You have given him wisdom and insight far beyond his years. Lord, for that we thank you. Lord, we thank you for the hope of the resurrection. For if anyone lives and believes in me, Jesus said, he shall live even if he dies. And if anyone believes in me, he shall never die. Do you believe this? Jesus said. Lord, thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for the hope of the resurrection. That Nabil is not here. He is very much alive. He is alive. Lord, we thank you for that truth. For the resurrection.